Hello CIS. Hello CIS 48. In this video, I'm going to go over week 11 notes. Um, as I don't require the assignment for this week, just focus on completing the quiz. And also, just make sure that you go over the content for this chapter, chapter 11, because you will find a lot of the questions will come from this chapter for our Network Plus um, practice tests and also your Network Plus certification. So the chapter to start with um, talking about the protocols for administration. Um, we know that Telnet can be used and Telnet uses port 23. This is a way that we can connect one system to another system um, using plain text. However, this is a not very secure protocol. So I don't recommend using Telnet as we already have SSH. So SSH is a better protocol that we would use to be able to establish connection using um, a system to a server or a host to a host. Now, in the next protocol, we would see that it is secure shell and SSH is a cryptographic network protocol. We would use SSH to connect to a cloud system. We would use SSH to be able to connect to um, another system like a Linux server or a Linux desktop. In Windows, you would use RDP, which is the next protocol, but SSH uses port TCP port 22. Make sure that you remember the port number for the certification. This is a way that we can securely connect, establishing a channel over the network, and we would be able to connect to the SSH server in order to establish a connection. Um, so it works really well with Unix or Linux operating systems. Um, it can also be used on Windows. However, Windows to Windows would be using the RDP. So if you're using a Linux system connecting to Windows, you would use SSH. If you're using Windows to Windows system, uh, if you terminal into a Windows system, then you would use RDP. And RDP is Remote Desktop Protocol. This is mostly implemented for Microsoft environment. This uses port TCP port uh, 3389 and UDP port 3389. This is a way that we would be able to establish remote access for Windows systems. So if I have a Windows 10 that needs to be connected to a server 2019 <coughs> remotely, I would need to establish the connection via RDP. VNC, if you are familiar with VNC in Raspberry Pi, this is known for uh, desktop connection. It's a way that we would be able to use virtual network computing, allowing us to be able to graphically share a desktop with another system. Now, VNC is very platform independent. Um, it does give you capability to navigate through another desktop through the connection, but you also need to make one system a server and the other is the client to be able to connect. Um, you can install real VNC. This is commonly used in an, uh, an operating system like Raspbian or in Raspberry Pi. Um, you can use this in Linux systems connecting to another Linux system. However, um, recommended that we would use SSH for a secure shell, which takes you to terminal. It does not give you the interface with the desktop. So if you want to use the desktop, you would use VNC. And real VNC is a product that's currently available. HTTPS is a way that we would set up a domain um, URL so that way we can click the URL in order to integrate web face uh, management, or we can also go through a firewall, HTTP or HTTPS, and authenticate through the firewall in order to connect to a system remotely. So there are many ways, as you can see, to be able to connect system to system. Now, we also need to understand the technology and how system will be able to access files and the topology will, that will look like. So the rest of the chapter, it goes over
how to be able to integrate um, file access remotely. So if I have remote workers um, who are accessing my network, I would be able to distribute files using file transfer protocol, your FTP, and you can have attached storage like NAS. Um, you can also have servers to be able to integrate in. When we um, experimented with the lab, we would use the file and storage server. So you can create um, also network shares to be able to mount that to a folder and be able to cut, use that folder on the desktop environment for Windows systems. So there are many approach in that, but often you would find that we would need to be able to support it through the storage server and most company would use FTP or FTPS. Now for SFTP, which is using SSH, it is piggybacking on port 22. It is a way for us to be able to directly connect to the server itself to be able to securely establish the session for file upload and download. For TFTP, this is for Trivial File Transfer Protocol. This is connection oriented using port 69, but it also uses port 21 as it is a way to directly connect to a system for fast file transfer. This is often used to back up images, like if you create an image for a certain set of system on your network and be able to store that into a backup, you would use TFTP. And um, we can also use it for configurations for our switches and routers and our network appliances. So that's what you often see as far as the industry. Now in the next section, it talks about communications and the different type of network legacy network along with the current network. So in the out of band management section, it talks about how we will be able to administer device for network connection that is limited. Um, we would need to be able to connect to the actual network appliance like the router, the switch, or the security appliance in order to access the command line. And this is used for management and configuration so an administrator can remotely work from home um, configuring the, the switch, the router, and the security appliance. That's if you set up the configuration on those appliances to be able to remotely connect through the console port. Um, most of the Cisco devices, you would see that it has this capability, but you have to enable it. So you would need to make sure that you have that configured before you remote into it. Now, um, in some part of the country and in other part of the, the world, you would see that modem would be used to gain remote access. And that can be either Telnet or SSH. Most of the time we would implement SSH as it would have secure session for us. And it would be able to generate the, the key for you to be able to access a specific system for that session. And in a lot of the public network, if it's a public switch telephone network, which is what you've seen from the legacy type of communication system. For example, if you're looking at Sprint, AT&T, um, prior to our digital integration of our network, um, we would have analog based switching systems to be able to route calls. And this uses a uh, plain old telephone service, which is known as POTS. It is considered to be the first implementation of what we would know as the wide area network. And that's how we were able to connect from one network to another by dialing into the public switch telephone network and be able to use it to be able to connect to other network. And so back in the day, this is what happened when you do a dial up and you will be able to connect to AOL or um, Yahoo or you know Microsoft using the, the PSTN. So a little bit expanded on the public switch telephone network. It was considered to be the first WAN and we have phased out a lot of the analog part of the network as we digitize a lot of our network to give us faster speed and fast transaction and also more real-time communication. 
um, with our mobile devices. So what you would see with the old telephone network, the PSTN, in that the computers would then use a dial-up modem and that modem, that device, it looks very much like the network interface card, but in the back of it, instead of connecting an ethernet cable, you would see a smaller type of connector, which is the RJ11 instead of the RJ45, and it would use telephone line. And so what that modem does is it modulate and it demodulates. So it would convert the analog signal into digital and it would digit it would then convert the digital signal from the computer to the analog to be able to transmit so now the limitation with that is that it's going to be low, slow in speed so analog lines were about 56 kilobit per second so it was very slow connecting to a certain website it would take a long time for the web server to respond and be able to load the pages on the actual computer when you're connecting to it um, later on, we were able to integrate ISDN and T1 or T2 lines. This is allowing us to be able to connect point-to-point -point link with the digital path. However, it would be a little higher in cost compared to what you were seeing with the PSTN. So the businesses, if they want faster transaction back then um, in the late 90s, you would see and even the early 2000s, you would see that you you would have integration of ISDN and T1. And it depends on the type of service provider. Some service provider would charge based on data. Other service provider would charge based on time that you would use, the minutes, the seconds, and so on. So, um, so we were able to improve digital lines that would be reaching 2 gigabit per second. And for that time, that was tremendous compared to a lot of the connection for communication was in between 128 kilobit per second to a slightly higher than that. But um, most of the time, household, you would see about 56 kilobit per second and up to 128 kilobit per second with the later mo mo modem technology and also network integration with the service provider. So with that, we would know that there are two different types of modem. You would have an external modem that looks very similar to what you see with the wireless appliance today, like an AP or a wireless router. Um, it does have the telephone line connection. Um, it would sit on the desk next to the computer and you would be able to connect to it. Or you can install an adapter inside the computer that is an internal modem. It is an expansion card that is inserted into the slot. And in the back of it, like I described, you would see that it would be a, a telephone connection instead of an ethernet connection like what you've seen today. So that's how we were able to connect our computer systems to the larger network or what we call the wide area network. So expanding on the ISDN, we would so ISDN is defined as integrated services digital network. This is allowing us to, this is a type of system that digitized telephone connections. It's able to transmit digital to digital compared to what we've seen um, in the past where we would use the telephone line in the PSTN. Now voice and data would then be carried in different channels. So it uses two main channels, the B and the D, often two of the channels B and one of the channel D. And just make sure that you remember the type of channel for the network bus certification. Channel B is mainly used for data transfer and it transfer at 64 kilobit per second. This is known as the bearer channel. Channel D is used for signaling and that is often connecting between 16 kilobit per second or 64 kilobit per second. So in order to establish B, it needs to enable D first. So it needs to establish signal in order to transfer data. Um, so with that, we can say that channel D enables channel B to pass data. And it's also used to administrative overhead for the channel B. So it would establish the connection. So you already have a transfer rate and an open channel for that 
particular data path. And so therefore, once um, D is established, then the channel, the two channel Bs would be able to be used to transmit data. And the bandwidth on the channel D would be depending on the type of service that you acquire. Um, like I said, there would be different type of tier. So now there are two categories in ISDN, the BRI and the PRI. So the BRI is the basic rate interface, which is a little bit slower, but here it talks about consisting of two 64 kilobit per second B channel and one 16 kilobit per second D channel, which total up to be 144 kilobit per second. And that will be the maximum. You often see that it will transfer at about 128 kilobit per second, which is double, right? If you're taking two of the 64 kilobit per second, that means you take 64 kilobit per second, you multiply it by two, which gives you 128 kilobit per second for the data transfer rate. And you would have a remaining of 16 kilobit per second that's left over out of 144. That is just basically used for signaling. And that's what you see with channel D and two of the channel B would give us the data transfer rate, your throughput. Now, um, the benefit of using BRI or basic rate interface in that it it provides the existing wiring. So in in a network that previously used the telephone line, they can integrate that and they simply just apply or install the modems that's needed to be able to accommodate the ISDN and also on the backbone they need to be able to integrate that with the service provider. So it is simply a better solution than the previous solution and it is low cost. Um, mostly used for home and small business and the subscription the challenge with BRI is that you can subscribe um, so the, the distance would be 18,000 feet away from the main telephone network or about 3.4 miles. So what the service provider would use like AT&T and some of the older um, service provider, they would use extender to be able to expand that to longer distance for the wider area. Now, ISDN, going back to the top of the page, they also support higher speed channel, which is channel H. And what happens is in the channel H, you would have not just two of the B channel, you actually have six for H0, for H10, you have 23 channels, H11, you would have 24 channels, and H12, you would have 30 B channels. So some facility on the larger enterprises, you would see that they would capitalize on using the channel H with the service provider that will be able to give them a little bit higher in the data transfer rate. Um, now in North America, you would see that it would use the others except for H12. H12 was used for European standards in that the throughput would be 1920 kilobit per second. So 1920 kilobit per second which uses 30B channel. That's the highest compared to North America um, and other part of the world. So the second type of ISDN that you would see is your primary rate interface, which is your PRI. And this requires T1 carrier. Um, so this is a tier one. This one contains 23B channels. So the PRI actually falls under this, the range of H10, and it also gonna require one um, of the D channel, which is 64 kilobit per second. And keep in mind that the, the D channel was mainly used for signaling, so the signaling is now a lot faster um, in the prime primary rate interface compared to what you've seen with the the basic rate interface. So this gives us a total of 1536 kilobit per second. This was mostly used in Japan and North America. Um, and compare that to Europe, you see that it is a little bit slightly slower. 
uh, in other parts of the world, right? And now the requirement for integrating the ISDN, not simply that we would use the device, uh, you know, integration, you also need to integrate appliances, routers, adapters, switches, and devices that are specifically used for ISDN. So it use, these devices use ISDN standard. Um, that means that it needs to connect to an end node on the network. So there would be an end node that it would be terminating the signal. So the protocols that would be used are the NT1, the NT2, the TE1, the TE2, and the T8. So in this picture, in this diagram, you would see that there is the ISDN switch. It would then connect to the NTI, and then you would have various terminating uh, type of device like TE1 and TE2. So we can expand on this on the next page. So R on the diagram that define the reference points between the TE2 and the T TA device. And so that we have to establish the reference point when we're using ISDN. Um, it's either R or S or T or U. So each of these lines would, would have some kind of reference point depending on the type of devices that you're connecting. Just think of it like specific lines for specific devices. So it was very particular because um, in the devices on how it would be able to transmit the signal um, that will be different and how it would terminate the signal will be different. So the S defines the reference point between the TE1 device and the NT1 or the NT2 devices. The T defines the reference point between the NT1 and the NT2 devices. And U define the reference point between NT1 devices and termination equipment. And so what is NT1? NT1 is known as the Network Terminator 1. This communicates directly to the central office switch. So coming in from the actual service provider, uh, you would then integrate an NT1, which is going to be uh, interfacing from the central office switch to the next level of your device. So it, what it would do is it would receive the U interface connection from the telephone company and it would put out the, the signal for the T interface connection to the next level, which is the NT2. And NT2 stands for the network terminator 2. And this, the, the NT1, it mostly handled the physical connection as you know that it would be for signaling. And so it would be more on the electrical signal and the electrical termination. With the NT2, it would then be placed after the NT1 between the NT1 and other terminal equipment. So we would then need to use the S interface, which accepts the T interface from the NT1. And this is when it would start handle the data link which is when it would then use that to create frame and before we can start building. Uh, so we would do then build frames in order to create packets for routing and be able to transmit that across the network. So from NT1 into NT2, NT1 handles the physical connection. NT2 is going to be for data link. And when you're using local devices like computers, it would then need to be able to communicate with the TE1, which is which uses the S interface. So the terminal equipment would need to be connected to NT1 or NT2, such as your telephone or your fax. And the telephone system used for ISDN is specific. Um, so you would then have the ISDN telephone or the fax machine. The terminal equipment too, that would be your commonly classified everyday devices, um, like your computing devices, your computer systems, and so on. So anything that doesn't fall under the TE2 category or the TE1 category, it would fall into the TE2 category. 
and the terminal adapter would then be able to use to connect these devices that would attach to the R interface. So as you can see that installing this type of network would be a little bit more challenging. You would see this happening also in banks, in businesses, in organizations. Um, so as I was entering the field, I started doing some of this and, and transition that. So my time was more ATM switch and then transitioning to when, uh, you know, years later, we would start integrating the ISDN. Um, so now when you're using the TA terminal, that would be connecting your TE devices and that would be using the S interface. So ISDN modem would then need to, to be connected to the computers. These are particular type of modem that would use to be able to connect. And back then they would sell expansion card that would be um, integrating at 128 kilobit per second for ISDN line. And your telephone company would be servicing ISDN just very much like what you've seen with fiber where you would be able to use a certain type of router with your fiber networks and so on. So very much like that, where you have to subscribe and then they will be able to lease you the equipment and you will be able to connect your system that way, whether it's for home or for business use. So ICN have five different type of identifiers to make the connection. The way that it works is that it has to use some kind of numbers, um, like how we would see today where we would use a telephone number to call. So the because it's built on the telephone network, it needs to have a directory number, which is your 10 digit telephone number. That is gonna be really narrow it down on the logical mapping on where that system is. It also use what's called the SPID or the service profile identifier. And it, with the DNs, you can have up to eight DNs that's assigned to one device. So you can have uh, multiple numbers that will be able to assign to the device. Um, so for a business that they might have a customer service number, uh, a, compl a complaint line number, and so on, they would be able to subscribe for that particular service where they have multiple numbers that can be assigned to that telephone. Um, or that line. And so a single BRI for home or business use, you can dedicate that. So in a small business, we can have multiple numbers and you can also have, you can have eight devices, meaning that each of the device can have eight numbers. So you can have up to 64 directory numbers. And that was scaling for most business use. Uh, some homes might have multiple numbers, um, so you might be able to adapt it for two, three different telephone number that would reside for that particular home using this type of technology. A SPID normally is about 10 to 14 characters, right? What it does is that we would use the DN, which is your 10 digit telephone number, and they would add extra characters to specifically identify uh, the, the actual device. So that way, when it gets to the location, it would be able to know, right, which telephone to be able to send that to. Um, and so when you're connecting to the larger network, it needs two things. Remember that it needs to spin and it needs the DN. The DN really gets it to the logical location and then, then it would narrow down on the actual device. There are three dynamic identifiers in the terminal endpoint identifier, which is known as the, T, to the TEI. This allows you to have a service address point identifier, your SAPI, and the bearer code. So the TEI identifies the particular device to the switch. So the switch would then be able to specify which device that's communicating. And it is dynamically allocated, similar to what you've seen with integrating uh, the HCP with the switch. And so the service address 
would be able to use a certain interface on the switch to connect. And remember, the interface is really for communication ports. So that way, it would be able to send it to a certain path. Um, for bear code is an identifier that's made up of the combination of TEI and SAPI. This allows us to use the call reference and the dynamic, uh, which changes over time once the connection is established. So the advantage of this compared to what you see with the dial-up is that it is higher in speed. You're able to have multiple channels to pass data through the regular telephone line. The computer connection is completely digital instead of converting analog to digital and so on. Um, it supports multiple devices link, so you can have multiple telephone numbers, you can have multiple devices, and you can have separate channel to be able to carry more data. So we would have higher throughput in, in sending and receiving data. Now, why is this important in remote access, you would say? Well, if you look at the configuration for remote access, remote access, there's still um, some company would still revert to the, the, this particular, the older technology in order to have a secondary line just for emergency to be able to connect to their network. Um, and then in most sense, we would see that we had integrated the newer technology. So as remote access was birthed in the area of telephone uh, analog signal and transitioned slowly, to what we see with digitized network, we would see that some of the protocol was mainly adapted for older technology and eventually be improved to, to be accepting you know, cryptography and encapsulation and so on. So we would have more of a secure line and prevent eavesdropping. Um, so in remote access services, there are two main protocols that were prevalent for RAS, which is SLIP, Serial Line Internet Protocol, and the newer integration from SLIP would be your point-to-point -point protocol. And point-to-point, -point, the benefit of this is that it can use TCP IP, so you can use IP addresses, you can integrate TCP, which allows you to have more reliability in, in package you know, transferring and also integrating with ports. Um, it also can be adapted with IPX and SPX, which is Internet Packet Exchange and Sequent Packet Exchange, and NetBuy, which is, they are the older technology. Um, and so PPP operates at the data link layer, and it's able to encapsulate for higher network protocols, so it allows routing, and also we can use it synchronously or asynchronously over the lines. Now, it is a serial point-to-point -point link, so we would be able to use higher level data link control to encapsulate data for the transmission. So remember that it uses HDLC, and it also uses LCP to test and configure the data link. So it has to test to make sure that the data link is established, and then in order to transmit data at a higher level, it has to use HD LC in order to encapsulate the data. And then third, it uses, uh, it integrate what's called the network protocol or the NP to configure the communication, other communication protocols. Now compare that to SLIP. SLIP also supports TCP IP. It was designed to connect to Unix servers over the telephone line. It cannot integrate DHCP. That's the main key is that you cannot use dynamic IP, you have to use static IP with SLIP. And they both use modems, so when you are remotely connecting, you have to use modem for these. Again, like I said, these are the, the older protocol to support the old technology. The network control protocols, your NCP, is a network layer protocol. Um, it Within it, it's able to integrate Internet Protocol Control Protocol, or IPCP, and it allows you to configure IP and disable IP modules at the end link. Uh, 
Next, also, it, because it works with IPX and SPX, it is able to integrate Internet Packet Exchange Control Protocol, which it allows you to enable and disable IPX control module. And then lastly, it would be able to work with NetBuoy or NetBIOS Frame Control Protocol is in charge of that. And so NetBuoy protocol allows us to be able to connect the module at the data link. So the functionality of PPP um, in that it would first send the LCP frame, but it needs to test and configure the data link. Then authentication protocol would then negotiate using CHAP or PAP, which the user has to put in the username and password or the user ID and password. Once that's established, it would then send the client system would then send the LC frame to configure the network layer protocol. So that way it established a session. Each of the network protocol would then be passed through this connection. And in order to encapsulate data so that way it would stream past the PPP connection, it needs to keep the link alive and so that way the you know the communication is established through lcp or ncp frame now until it gets an error or an external event happens or when something is disconnected uh, it could be that the user end the sessions then it would then close the frame and be able to stop the link okay so once it's established that link stays active now the control mechanism for this is just to enable the protocol to be able to communicate. So those are the supporting protocol. So how does it, it knows um, on, on the frame and the status of this? It uses what's called the finite state automation, which is your FSA. These are the processes that allows the status messages between the layers to coordinate and it's a way to keep track of the protocol on syncing and enable them to be able to service at different stages of the process in remote access and so ppp when it frames and format the data for encapsulation it like we said before it uses hdlc for basic encapsulation and it was widely implemented especially for ppp um, in that it would facilitate multiplexing NCP player. So think of like a point to point to point protocol. So what happens is that we would need to connect from one system to the next system, and then it would establish that to be able to forward it to the next level and so on. Now, it also used DTE and DCE, which allows us to have multiplexing circuit. Um, we're able to send and receive and we can use it either dedicated as with the dedicated or the switch network synchronously or asynchronously. So the transmission rate would then be limited by the interfaces um, and it is not controlled by PPP. Okay, so the computer or our terminal can use to communicate with other system. Like I said before, we would require a modem to be connected. Now for authentication, it would use PAP, CHAP, and MS CHAP. Mainly PPP was integrated for the Microsoft systems. So in the Microsoft system, we would then use NS MS CHAP, but CHAP was originally used. Uh, so here it talks about how we would be able to establish communication through authentication. So these are the authentication protocol in that the user has to authenticate using a username and password. So that will be PAP. It would then match that with the server. If it's exactly matching, then it will enable the connection. Um, otherwise, it would not allow the connection. Now, later on, we integrate chat which uses encryption to be able to pass the credential. So before that, it was plain text. Now with chat, it's able to encrypt your, use, your password and be able to 
prevent the attacker from seeing your password. And in chat, the server would then generate randomly a uh, challenge request with the host names. And so the client would then use some kind of secret password and return a hash. So it uses the hash mechanism. Chat sends challenge on the regular interval. So it's not just one time, it's repeated to verify that the client is still connecting and the correct client is doing that. So PAP was often used for public uh, FTP sites or public area where chat would then be used for more private. Now for the Microsoft system, we would use MS chat and MS chat uses the same technology as chat. As you know that now we would have used different version of MS chat. So the server would then send a challenge and return the username in MD4 hash and with the challenging string, session ID, and the hash password. So it is higher in security compared to what you've seen with PAP, where it would be plain text. And so the server, as it authenticates, the authenticator would then store the password in encrypted format. So that gives us a higher level of security. Now, in our environment today, we want to implement multi-factor authentication, but also multi-factor authentication existed back then. Um, we would integrate something you know, something you have, something you are, and something you do. Something you know would include password pin, uh, security questions, and so on. Um, something you have would be smart card, USB token, email, smartphone. Something you are would be biometrics such as fingerprint, facial, or retinal recognition and uh, something you do that would be pattern like swipe on your phone or one would be able to sign the name. Now on the current Windows system we would use mutual authentication protocol which is Kerberos. Make sure you know Kerberos for Network Plus. This is used to authenticate the server and the client that's based on ticket granting system. So you have to integrate the ticket granting service which is would be distributed by the server and it would also use certificate base to be able to grant. So in order to uh, authenticate, right, it needs to be able to obtain a ticket to be able to access for a certain amount of time. And that can be controlled based on, you know, how long the user would then need to access. So it would expire at a certain period of time if you set it to be expiring within two hours or 24 hours and so on. Now, some of the additional terms or terminology that you need to know is local authentication that will be only authenticated to that local system. So if I'm on my local computer right now, right, I would then be able to authenticate to that local system. And LDAP is your lightweight directory access protocol. This is used in Active Directory to be able to access. So Active Directory, as you know, would be a role that contains the database for user accounts, system information for authentication purposes. Certificates in Windows system, uh, it uses certificate authority, and that's a role for the server to be able to authorize certificates, which are electronic files that contain public and private key. So that way, it can be configured for smart card, um, like your ATM cards, or for application purposes. Now, we know that all systems have some form of logging. It's a way to be able to record things like authentication attempts, and we would be able to audit the logging uh, by looking or reviewing at, you know, the the type of attempt successful or failed attempts um, in the authentication process because in remote access authentication is a way that we would be able to validate um, and authorize the type of access to a certain system based on the credential that is submitted now many of the business as you know including rccd uh, use a single sign-on. This allows the user to be able to access a wide variety of files, folders, uh, resources like printers, database server, and applications. After the authentication is success, it simply take 
the access token and be able to use that access token with the API uh, application or game interface to be able to talk to different type of application and app different type of uh, web interface. So that way it can allow the user to access at multiple level. And so the user doesn't have to re-authenticate many times. As long as the session is remain open, uh, that user is able to access all the resources that's granted or authorized to that user based on who they are in the network. So some of the points in troubleshooting PPP in that we talked about how it would be able to provide the log. So the log for the communication devices would then specify the type of protocol, the type of control, the type of communication is established. This is a way that we can track, we can monitor, and we can fix some of the problem by looking at the logs. And it would look like the screenshot that's shown on page seven. So some of the highlights for PPP in that it can run on TCP IP, it can be used with IPX and SPX, it can be used with NetBuoy, um, and Apple Talk, that's for Apple Network and DeckNet. Now it can also use dynamic host control protocol to be able to use dynamic IP addresses. It does perform error checking and support compression. So make sure that we remember these highlights for your certifications. Next, we're going to talk about PPOE, which is a point to point protocol over Ethernet. And this is a way that we would be able to connect at a higher speed uh, compared to what we see with dial up, right? So the, the area where we, after dial up, and ISCN, we would see more on DSL, especially for home use, and there are different type of DSL. So uh, dial-up networking was uh, when you set that up with the, the connection from point to point for remote access, you would then specify that you are going to connect through the telephone line. But through the telephone line, we can establish your uh, DSL connection. So DSL required that also you would use DSL modems and modems are used for data communication across devices. So it's able to pass your data to the old telephone network from node to node. Now there are two types of modem. There are the asynchronous and synchronous. So asynchronous treat data sent separately, relying on node on the other end to translate the bit order. And in the asynchronous, you would see that your upload and download speed are different. So you would likely see that your download will be higher than your upload. Synchronous, it sends data in the steady stream using clock signal to interpret the beginning and the end packets. So for DSL speed, you would see that synchronous would use same speed for upload and download. In the requirements for remote access, you would need to have some form of connection for the client. So you would need to set up your client. If you're using dial-up, you would then have a network client dial-up. You have to set up the proper number uh, with for the server and the type of protocol and authentication information. So some of that would need to be pre-configured from the facility before we give the laptop or the device to the individual user. On the remote access server side, you have to enable remote access on the network and we would be able to establish, create accounts using PPP, SLIP, or RAS. So just like what we've done with the lab, you have to have users in a certain group to be able to manage them, to be able to access your remote server. And then on your remote server, you have to set up the configuration on you know, how the system would be connected. And then on the system itself, like a laptop uh, or a desktop from a home user, we would then need to make sure that the configuration have the server information to be able to dial in or connecting to the server. And then also set up the protocol that's appropriate. 
Next, we're going to talk about virtual private network. And VPNs are abundantly used now. It's a way that we can protect communication across unsecured medium, especially when we're surfing the internet or we're using some type of service over the internet. So the primary VPNs, as it is piggybacking on the remote access technology, it also uses PPP, it also uses SLIP. And additionally, we see this in our lab, it uses point-to-point -point tunneling protocol, your PPTP, also your L2TP, layer two tunneling protocol, and your secure socket transport protocol, your SSTP. So PPTP is a way that we can securely transfer the data for your remote client to a private server by using multiple protocol virtual private network. We would use TCP IP as an alternate or conventional dial-up networking method. Uh, we would be able to use it over the TCP IP network. We can take advantage of security in that it does the tunnel uh, through the standards. And VPN would then be able to provide the tunneling for secure communication. Now, in the old VPN protocol, we would use PPP traffic. But in the newer technology, we would use PPTP or other protocol. And PPTP uses generic routing encapsulation, which is known as GRE. This is used to transfer packets um, of PPP. So PPTP piggybacks on PPP. Uh, it is a later integration after PPP. So for the Microsoft system, it would use Microsoft point-to-point -point encryption to encrypt the traffic and port 1723 would allow the traffic in the firewall and it would use protocol ID 47 to carry the data on the firewall. So you have to set up on the firewall as well in order to integrate PPTP as your VPN protocol. So then, um, there are two processes in PPTP. Like I said, it uses PPP to connect to the remote network first. And then it would also use PPP to encrypt your data packets and pass through your, your local machine. The way that it control the connection when PPP is established, so it uses that to establish communication between the client and the server. This is the process is called tunneling. Okay, so that's just for communication establishment. And PPTP data tunnel creates what's called an IP datagram that gets routed to the appropriate host. Now, the setup for PPTP requires that you need to set up your client system with your server IP address or your fully qualified domain name, which is like HTTP slash slash, right? Uh, so and so.com, etc. And so on the client side, we need to set that up. On the server side, we need to enable the connection uh, through the protocol and also. We also need to configure the firewall to be able to pass through the traffic. Then the network access server would then connect to the network to be able to call your PBTP. So we have to set up NAS to be able to forward that. Now, I put a procedure on how you would do this on Windows 10. You would go into settings, network and internet. You would click on VPN. You would need to add a VPN connection and you would choose the type of VPN you would use, L2TP or IPsec, etc., etc. right? Um, then you would specify the connection name and be able to put in the server location, uh, server name, server IP address, 
and so on. So this needs to be set up on the client system like your Windows desktop or laptop. And then once you complete that process, you would then save the configuration after you input in your sign-in authentication information. And then you would click connect. And if everything is configured properly, it would then be able to establish the connection. Now, there are different type of protocols that you can use for VPN. Some of you are familiar with OpenVPN, like if you're using a web service VPN, most of them uses open source protocol that allows uh, you to use AES 256-bit encryption key with 20, uh, 2048-bit RSI authentication and 168-bit SHA hash algorithm to be able to connect and so that way your traffic is invisible to someone that's trying to eavesdrop. Another protocol in VPN that you would see would be SSTP, and this stands for Secure Socket Tunnel Protocol. It was mentioned earlier, but to really define it, it would be that it is used in Microsoft operating system after Windows Vista. It uses 2048-bit SSL TLS certificate. So this was mainly aimed for web interface or web-based uh, VPN. And SSL TLS was used to authenticate. It would use 256-bit SSL keys for encryption. The drawback for this is that the proprietary protocol was uh, do not have access to the underlying code, so it was not fully established. It does give you the good security. Uh, it's difficult to block and detect, and it does give some native third-party clients uh, capability there. The third protocol that you might see for VPN tunneling would be your, IK, your IKE version 2. The prior version to this would be just IKE v1 or IKE. This is also named as ISAC MP or ISAK MP. This is known as your internet key exchange. And for the version 2, this is a common VPN protocol, tunneling protocol. It uses key exchange. So like L2TP, IK, uh, which is your I, IKE version 1. The version 2 would pair with IPSEC or IP security for encryption and authentication. Um, now, the protocol is very good at reestablishing link for temporary connection, and it does do well with switching network across. Um, so fast, mobile friendly, network switching capability, open source options, and it works with third-party clients very well. Now, L2TP, or known as IPsec, this uses AES 256-bit encryption. It is more of an advanced encryption standard. That's what's implemented in the industry today. Um, it does a double encapsulation, make it slower than the other tunneling protocol. Compared this to PPTP, it is slower. It does have some restriction with firewall bypassing as it uses fixed ports and the VPN connection with L2TP is easier to block. It is a popular protocol, it, but it does give you elevated security. So it does have some decent speed, but slower than PPTP. It is widely used. It is easily blocked. Uh, due to the reliance of UDP or using a single port. So there's some drawback with that. You're now comparing what really is your SSH to VPN. SSH is really to connect to a certain system where VPN is then used to connect to a network. So let's be clear on that. Okay. So next, I have some topologies to represent VPN. Um, now, in configuration of your routing and switching, you would have to think about how your, you integrate the VPN based on your network needs. So the first option would be your site-to-site -site virtual private network. This is connection between two or more networks, such as corporate networks, to the branch not office. So in the enterprise level, you would see more on site-to-site. -site. So if I'm in the branch office, I will be able to uh, 
use site to site VPN to be able to connect to the headquarter office to be able to access certain report engine, etc., uh, databases, applications, and so on. So in a larger network, you often see site to site. Many organizations would use this to leverage internet connection for private traffic. So that way it would keep uh, using the private M M MPLS circuits. It is used by companies that have many offices or multiple offices geographically. It could be across the world, across states, across nations, um, and would need to be able to access resources for corporate. A uh, company can securely connect to its corporate network with the remote offices to share resources on a single network. So this is what it would look like uh, to really simulate that to show you the VPNs for the site to site. Now it does establish the permanent connection which uses encrypted link that would treat it as a site so you would need to set up ipsec network to be able to use a uh, connection between your networking equipment like your switches and routers and your security appliance here is the site to site um, that would look like this so if i'm at branch one and i can connect to branch two and I simply would be able to establish through the firewall. So you can have your firewall set up and you can connect through the firewall. So if I need to access resource from one branch to another branch, a site to a site, I can do that, okay? And it would be more on like subsidiary network connecting to headquarter office it would be the same. For the remote access VPN, this is for temporary VPN connection that will be allowing the users to be able to connect to headquarters, typically to access data center applications. Um, it could use IPSEC, but commonly use SSL VPN because it is easier for the user to authenticate using their username and password instead of connecting using IP addresses. <laughs> So you would often see that they would set up the fully qualified domain name um, and then be able to do some self-registration or uh, have provided the user account and password to be able to connect. And so this is more on how we would be able to manage user endpoints through the VPN gateway. So you would have the edge router routing that after it, they bypass after they authenticate through the firewall, then your edge router will be able to bring that traffic into the, the appropriate database or system or application server that needs to service these users. So remote access VPN is mostly used for temporary usage with the user access. And it will look something like this from my home network connecting to your business network. And we would often see this now um, with a lot of the remote worker in, in uh, COVID time. Then you have the client to site virtual private network. This is where the clients from the internet can connect to the server, accessing the corporate network, the local air network behind the servers. So you do have some workers that are using client to site server. Um, now this feature is useful when you create a new VPN tunnel that will allow teleworkers or business travelers to be able to access their resources like software and files um, without jeopardizing the security. So that will be the type of topology that you would integrate so you would need to set up your gateway and then that is going to be routed back to your corporate network or your network. Then we have a host to host using IPSEC connection, which then would be encrypted connection between two systems, um, both running IPSEC with the same authentication key. So let's say that um, I have a Raspberry Pi running at home and I am connecting to it through my work network. 
I won't be able to connect directly to it if I set it up where my router would be able to route to it. And so it is a direct host to host connection. Um, so it would be something like this. So I, and, and sometimes you can remotely connect to your router for configuration if you need to change. Um, a lot of the router allows you to use an HTTP and then you authenticate as an admin and be able to go in and modify some of the configurations for your wireless router. Um, so you would be able to do that. So here I am at host A, which is going to be on my computer. And then I would connect to my service provider and be able to establish a tunnel using IPSEC to connect to host B or host C or host D, right? Um, so if I need to connect with IPSEC, I can connect to host B. And what the traffic would be is if you use IPSEC is then it would be able to be encrypted. Okay. So these uh, give you a little bit better understanding on how to be able to work with VPN. Um, as we looked at how we set it up on the server system, you can test it by looking at your Windows 10 on how you'll be able to connect to your server and authenticate. But again, we have to be able to make sure that the firewall pass the traffic through. We have to have the user account. We have to have the proper protocol set up. Um, and in the lab, we use this L2TP. So now in the earlier technology, if you're using this with an older type of network, you would then consider you know using something that would be more legacy uh, using pptp or even dial up in some case of emergency where you can remotely connect to restart systems in the case of disasters or whatnot and so this concludes my lecture for cis 40a which we talked about remote access remote access protocol, VPNs, and VPNs protocol, topologies, and different types. And thank you for watching the video. Um, and if you have any questions, please let me know.